I heard some wonderfully interesting recordings on NPR yesterday morning. I was in the car, and the radio was on, and over it came a report of some newly ferreted out recordings, I think 12 in number, of some early sermons of Martin Luther King Jr. And they played over the air about 15 minutes of the earliest one that they have, a sermon that he preached on February the 28th, 1954, at the Second Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, when he was still a seminary student, in which King was preaching on absolute values. He suggested that in our increasingly relativistic age of the 1950s, we needed to know that lying was wrong, even if everybody was doing it, and that adultery was wrong, even if everybody was doing it, and that stealing was wrong, even if everybody was doing it. He said that the real issue that confronted our nation was the issue of character, of realizing what right and wrong were and that they were not relative, that it was wrong to hate in Germany and it was wrong to hate in Russia, that it is wrong to hate in Canada and it is wrong to hate in America, that wrong is wrong wherever it is and whenever it is. In that sense, you know, everybody from Martin Luther King, Jr., to William Bennett, from James Dobson to Jerry Falwell, can begin to sound alike. What we need to realize is that right is right and wrong is wrong. All of them have told us that the Bible teaches that morality is non-negotiable, that the Christian faith is about absolutes. And in that sense, we may feel that in this world where ethical boundaries are transgressed and moral borders seem to be dissolving, that we Christians want to slow things down, to highlight our moral reasoning, to fortify the long-respected behavioral boundaries of our culture, that this is right and that is wrong. And that is really what we Christians need to be about today. In that sense, true Christian faith would seem to be all about uprightness and propriety. About living as best we can. Perhaps even being the pillars of our society and quietly going about our own business. Leaving others to theirs. Are Christians basically nice, decent people? Is that sort of the sum and substance of it? Is propriety the same thing as piety? Is being respected the same as being right? True Christian faith is about righteousness, right? About My righteousness? You know, going to church, giving to charity? If a Christian is to be a good person, then it must be that to be seen to be a good person is to be a Christian. Right? Well, before we get carried away on this idea of such steely, unwavering virtue, as being at the very core of Christian faith. I think we should just read this little letter of Paul to Philemon. Paul's letter to Philemon is found on page 1,253 in your pew Bible. It's stuck right there between Titus and Hebrews. Paul's letter to the Philemon. To Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, 
and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, or you could read that an ambassador, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would, like, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. In this conclusion to our series on the nature of true Christian faith, I want us to consider a few pictures that we have captured for us in this letter. This letter, like the letter to the Colossians, which we've just gotten finished studying, is full of people, isn't it? Did you notice that as we read through it? As brief as it is, I think you can count up if you include Jesus, 12 different people that are mentioned in this brief letter. You've got Timothy and Apphia and Archippus and Epaphras and Mark and Aristarchus and Demas and Luke. But I want us to focus on the three fullest pictures that we have presented to us here in this New Testament miniature. This moment of real life captured in a verbal frozen frame on the pages of our Bible between Titus and Hebrews. And as we see these pictures and as we consider them, pray that you might see something of living Christian faith in them and in yourself this morning. First, look at this picture of someone being forgiven. This picture we have here of Onesimus. The story of Onesimus is something that we can reconstruct fairly well, it seems, from the basic parts of this letter. First, it appears that Onesimus was a slave. We get that from verse 16. He says there, no longer a slave, as if that's what he had been. Now, we considered earlier, a few sermons ago in this series on Colossians, what the nature of slavery was in the New Testament world. It doesn't mean that Onesimus was of any particular race. It didn't mean he did any particular job. 
It didn't mean he was in a particular minority because in most Hellenistic cities of the day it seemed that the majority of the working population were considered slaves, kind of indentured servants. So it doesn't tell us exactly about a lot of things which we might consider. He could have even been a kind of professional as many doctors and teachers were such indentured servants in the ancient world. But Onesimus was clearly a slave, an indentured employee, if you will, of some kind. And it seems from the whole tone of this letter, say from verse 14 on, that Onesimus had been a slave of Philemon's. And Paul wants Philemon to retain Onesimus's service. So he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon, he says, though no longer as a mere slave which implies, of course, that Onesimus was a slave. But something had gone wrong. Paul refers here in verse 11 to the fact that Onesimus had been useless to Philemon. And there in verse 14, he seems to infer that any continuation of Onesimus' being with Paul did not as yet anyway have Philemon's consent, even if Paul wanted Onesimus to stay with him. He felt somehow that he needed to get Philemon to agree to this. He refers to the the separation of Onesimus from Philemon as if it needed explaining. And then there in verse 18, he's clear. Paul realizes that Onesimus may owe some kind of debt to Philemon. In fact, he may have even wronged him. Now, Paul doesn't get any, any more specific than this, but it seems likely that this wrong was specifically an escape. We don't know this, I guess, but it seems clearly to be the case. Paul had to justify keeping Onesimus away from Philemon any longer, as if he should have been there. It seems that Onesimus was absent from Philemon without his consent. He was AWOL, absent without leave. Many have speculated from verse 18, where he mentions if he owes you anything, that what had really happened, Onesimus, this employee, this indentured slave of Philemon's, had actually stolen something from Philemon, And then in fear of retribution and of justice, he had run and escaped and fled away from Philemon. Well, whatever the reason, it seems that Onesimus had left Philemon in a bad way. And after having left, Onesimus had ended up with Paul. Somehow, he found Paul. And it seems that in Paul's company, Onesimus became useful. More than that, Onesimus apparently became a Christian. He found true Christian faith, it seems, from verse 10. Became my son while I was in chains, writes Paul. It seems he became converted while he was with Paul in prison. While he was with this person in jail. Paul, ever active, seems to have had a part in leading Onesimus to the Lord. He found true Christian faith there. And so he became useful and even dear, we read. A couple of times in this letter, Paul calls Onesimus dear. Someone that his heart has become attached to. Paul calls him very tenderly in verse 12, my very heart. But you know, as part of this conversion... Onesimus needed to redress the wrongs that he had done. And so, even if Philemon were to free him from his obligations when he returned, and we don't know if Onesimus would have even wanted that. He may have needed some kind of economic station when he went back to Colossae. And we don't know if Philemon would do it anyway. But even if that were the case, Onesimus still had to make restitution for whatever the wrongs were that had caused him to flee away from Philemon. Now, so there was Onesimus turning up, bearing this letter in Colossae. There he stood, in need of forgiveness, in need of being welcomed back into Onesimus' household, his service, and his good graces. The relationship there needed restoring, and Onesimus stood in need of Philemon's forgiveness. And then there was, when he turned up, I'm sure, this very awkward matter of restitution. What was Onesimus to do? He had apparently stolen from Philemon, But he may well not have had the the wherewithal to pay it back, to make it good. Certainly labor he had stolen, but apparently money or other objects 
So he stood in need of making some kind of financial repayment that he may have had no means to make. You know, I have had more than one friend who, when they became a Christian, have gone back and tried to right the wrongs that they've done. Who've tried in, in the conviction of sin that the Holy Spirit has brought into them as a part of their conversion to go back, whether by confessing sins and asking forgiveness, whether by writing letters, or in some cases even sending checks to pay for things that they had taken. I've seen people make restitution as Onesimus here stood in need of doing. Onesimus knew that he needed that. If you look at Paul's request here in verse 20, where he says at the end of verse 20, Refresh my heart in Christ. I wonder if Paul isn't speaking here specifically of Philemon's welcoming of, of, of Onesimus. Of Onesimus being his very heart. And Paul refreshing his heart by refreshing Onesimus. Philemon caring for Onesimus like this. Well, Onesimus needed someone to value him like that because he had apparently done things which would cause him to be viewed otherwise. And I wonder, too, if Paul didn't think that Onesimus needed a little extra looking after. Did you notice that there in verse 22 right at the end? It's like a P.S. Oh, Philemon, one more thing. I hope to be stopping by soon. Have a room ready for me. Just to make sure. Because, of course, Felix, fixing up Philemon's room wouldn't have been nearly as important to Paul as being able to see if Philemon was really caring for Onesimus. That would be the real purpose of a visit like that. So there was Onesimus, the slave who stole and then fled and found Paul, and in finding Paul found Christ and his way back home. So now Onesimus could only turn up there at Colossae at Philemon's house with this letter from Paul in his hand in need of forgiveness. Acknowledging his need before Philemon, his helplessness to repay him, his dependence really on Paul for being cared for and looked after. Can you imagine on one level the destitution of the man? Nothing that he can offer, and he's not making any excuses. There he stands. Onesimus is a picture of someone needing forgiveness. Look, too, though, at the picture of someone forgiving. Notice Philemon here. Because, of course, all of this that we've just noticed that Onesimus needed, Philemon was to supply. Consider how comprehensive this forgiveness was that Philemon was being called to. I guess it was summed up by his welcoming Onesimus. We read of there in verse 17. Philemon was to open his arms to one who had run from him. He was to invite him back into his home. And this would inevitably mean trusting him in very practical ways. So, for example, should he count his spoons every evening? What about when he, he sends Onesimus out to the market to get something? Should he just be very careful in counting the change when he comes back? Because he can't really trust him. Should he make sure that all the chickens were there or all of the bills were being paid? Of course, it also meant his charging any debt to Paul. Interesting, you know, that Paul doesn't just write to Philemon and say, forgive and forget. This is in the past, so let's just let the past be past. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say just put it out of your mind. He acknowledged that there was a genuine indebtedness which had been incurred and which had to be dealt with. Now, rather awkwardly, I think, Paul asked Philemon to shift over any debt which Onesimus may have had into his column. You know, Paul sort of acknowledged the debt, but then he stepped in and he said, Now, you know, I'll take care of this. I wonder if Philemon basically took that to mean eat the loss. You know, I mean, what was he supposed to do? Charge the great aged apostle when he was in prison in Rome? But whatever, I mean, Paul did acknowledge it. He said it up front and frankly. Though I can understand if Philemon was hesitant to, you know, send a bill of $100 to the great apostle in prison. You know, I mean, that would be a bit like spending your grandmother's social security check to buy ice cream. I mean, it's just, it's not the kind of thing you're going to want to do. So Paul acknowledged that it was there, 
that if Philemon were to forgive Onesimus, it would mean somehow resolving this indebtedness that Onesimus had occurred, even if it meant resolving it simply by taking the loss. It would have to be dealt with. It was part of the problem. And any forgiveness that Philemon would have to offer to Onesimus would have to take into account all of the real issues. They wouldn't just be swept under the carpet. Philemon's forgiveness of Onesimus entailed generally, it seems, his caring for Onesimus. Because Paul had made it clear that he would consider Philemon's kindness to Onesimus kindness to him. In this forgiveness, Philemon couldn't really then just be begrudging. You know, just kind of let him back in and forgive him for any robbery or whatever. I mean, no, the, the way Paul asks for this, Philemon would clearly have to care for Onesimus. He wouldn't be able just to let him back into his home. He would have to let him back into his heart to fulfill all the things we read of in these verses that were requested of him. Philemon was being faced with the demand to genuinely and from his heart forgive multiple wrongs that had been done to him and then even to restore the affectionate care in the relationship. And just to top it all, off. There is that verse 22 where it, Paul makes it clear that Philemon even needed to be prepared to be checked up on in this process. Not only was Philemon going to have to forgive, but Philemon was going to have to be known to have forgiven. He was going to have to be held to a certain measure of accountability in that forgiving of Onesimus. He would have to be prepared to give explanations for his actions or his lack of them. Now think for a moment who Philemon was, who it was that was being asked to do all this. If you consider his role in the church, it it seems that it was evidently pretty prominent. Philemon was not just anybody blindly picked out of the congregation. He was probably one of the few in that church that had a personal relationship with Paul. Remember, Paul had never been to Colossae, where Philemon was. Philemon had apparently been converted by Paul when Paul was in Ephesus. Not too far away, a number of years earlier, preaching. So Philemon was one of the few in that congregation that could brag that he actually knew the great apostle. He knew him personally. And also when a letter to the church comes, not only is there a letter to the church in general, but look, Paul wrote his own personal letter to Philemon as well. He was a prominent member. He was evidently a wealthy member. He was a member who had slaves. He was a member who had people who worked for him. And he had a house that he was willing to be generous with. In fact, it was in his house that the church met. He was the one who lived there and stewarded that property that the church would then meet in once a week. So Philemon was clearly a leader in the church. And as that, it was a demand that his actions be exemplary. He needed to forgive Onesimus. But how difficult could that be for him? You know, in the ancient world, people weren't even raised to think of forgiveness as something honorable. You and I are all sitting there thinking, tut, tut, come on, Philemon, get on with it. I mean, we know it's the right thing to do. It's just a matter of you being hard-hearted or recalcitrant. Come on, it's the right thing. It's the good thing to do to forgive somebody. But that's not the way he would have been raised, most likely. He would have not been raised to consider forgiveness something good. I mean, would he feel that he was showing weakness by doing this? Would it be a source of shame, maybe even, to to him among his neighbors? That he was so treating an employee, an indentured slave that had run away and people knew of it. Would he be worrying that such leniency might actually encourage Onesimus in his wrong? Might make it harder for him to learn about the truth? Would it even quietly encourage others with his example, thinking that they too could get off so lightly? And all of this is not even considering what's going on in Philemon's own self. Was Philemon one of those souls who feels every wrong keenly and every injustice like the stroke of a lash. You know how some of us, even if we're not personally involved in a situation, just have beings that seem to cry out for justice. When we hear of something wrong being done, just every fiber of our being wants to see it being made right. You know, whether it's what we've ordered at a truck rental place or what we've considered at a restaurant or at a library or what's happened to us at work, We just want everything to be right. And when it's not, we become absolutely indignant. Well, how much more could Philemon have felt that? 
about someone who had been a part of his own personal household. And yet here he was being called on very clearly to forgive. But then, after all is considered, wasn't Philemon obliged to forgive Onesimus? When you consider the pleas here made to him, the public role that he had in the church, his own experience of being forgiven by God, as painful as Onesimus, as forgiving Onesimus may have been in some ways, could Philemon really do anything else? Look at verse 6 with me for a moment. Paul says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You know, I'm going to do that thing that I do sometimes. You know, when I take one of your favorite verses, you've learned about something, and I tell you it's really not about that. Here I go, friends. I'm afraid I'm about to do it. This verse is often pulled off by itself and used as a great reason to evangelize. Because when you share your faith, as the NIV puts it, then you yourself grow as a Christian. Now let me quickly say it is an incontrovertible fact that when you engage in evangelism, when you share the good news with others, you do in fact grow as a Christian. That is a wonderful truth of God. Having said that, I don't think that's what this verse is talking about. If you look at the context, what Paul is talking about here, he's clearly talking about the faith sharing that isn't really the proclaiming the gospel to an unbeliever. It's expressing Christian forgiveness to a brother. And Paul is saying as he accepts Onesimus and as he brings him back in and restores him, as he does that, he will have a more full understanding of what God has done to him in Christ. He'll have a fuller understanding of the riches of his own Christian faith. In that sense, Philemon is a picture of someone needing to forgive. Finally, don't overlook one more picture in this story, this picture of someone encouraging forgiveness. Because, you know, the great one behind it all, pulling things, is Paul. Paul is the one who somehow intercepted Onesimus. Paul is the one who shared the gospel with him. And Paul is the one who has now sent him back and written this letter to go with it. Orchestrating all of this is Paul. He's the one who took the appeal, the initiative to appeal to Philemon. And he did so here when you read this letter in no uncertain terms. I mean, look exactly what he says. He says, welcome him. That's really the only thing he asks straight out for Philemon, uh, for Onesimus. He says there in verse 17, welcome him. And then he adds this important phrase, as you would welcome me. You see, the rest of Paul's letter couches all of his requests as things for himself. So fully has he identified with Onesimus, so much as he would help Philemon to be able to forgive him. He asked in verse 18 that Philemon would charge to Paul anything that needed to be repaid. Paul, in that sense, was willing to be billed to see this Forgiveness happened in this relationship restored. I mean, too often doesn't it seem like those who are involved in the work of restoring relationships bill us for the help they give us. But here Paul is saying, no, bill me. I so want to see this relationship restored that I am willing to take the time, the trouble, the effort, the financial investment if it takes that. To see this relationship restored. More than that, he makes himself the object of the appeal. As we've seen there at the end of verse 20, he's when he says, refresh my heart. Paul is so sincerely identifying with Onesimus that he can say to Philemon, look, if you do it for this one that I love, it will be like you've done it for me. I care that much for him. I care that much that this relationship be restored. Paul was investing himself fully like that. He was willing to expend even more pastoral capital to see this forgiveness and restoration through. Because that's where we get this final request from in verse 22. You know, prepare a guest room for me. And why do you think Paul did that? You think it would just be that he might happen to be coming through this town he'd never been to? No, Paul was investing his time. He was willing to go to visit to find out what was really happening. 
All of this Paul appealed to Philemon for. And notice how Paul appealed. He is, what's the word we should use? Pushy? In this letter? He, He certainly pushes the boundaries of what most of us would feel comfortable in doing. In asking for forgiveness for someone else. I mean, look exactly at what he did. Don't gloss it over. Paul seems to shamelessly put this church leader on the spot for the way he treated an employee who ran away from him. Now, you know, that church that church leader could feel indignant. There he's standing, having faithfully served the church. And what is Onesimus? Onesimus is an employee and an unfaithful one at that. Phrygian slaves, these people from Phrygia, this particular place that Onesimus seems to have been from, had a reputation for being useless. So it may be in verse 11 when Paul mentions formerly he was useless, now he's become useful, that he was actually playing on this stereotype of these servants from Phrygia. He says that he previously was useless. So Paul here is saying and admitting that Onesimus was useless, and Paul is willing to put Philemon's work and effort on the line for Onesimus? For a person like this? How offended could Philemon feel? Couldn't he feel like Paul was even being disloyal to him and putting such pressure on him, caring for such a wayward one who had showed himself really to be worthless? Well, Philemon could feel that way if he understood everything about Christianity and the church except the gospel. If he understood that there is right and wrong, that there are consequences to actions, That surely we must be exemplary in our lives. Yes, in all those ways, Philemon could have felt like that. But if God's Holy Spirit had ever convicted Philemon of his own sin, then there's no way he could take any umbrage at all, be offended in even the slightest way at the thought that Paul should call him on the carpet to forgive someone who had no social standing in the community. And no influence was cared for no one necessarily at all, except for by God. And so uh, Paul pulls out all the stops here. Look at how he does it. Verse 8, he doesn't quite pull rank on Philemon, but he gets awfully close. He says, I won't do this, but I could. Well, we know what that's like. You know, he's encouraged Philemon earlier by the love that he has for all the saints. He says that in verse 5. He says that in in verse um, verse 7. He talks about the love that Philemon has shown for all the saints. So then in verse 9, he appeals to Philemon on the basis of this acknowledged attribute of his life, of love. And Paul so identifies himself with Onesimus that he basically tells Philemon to show his sympathy for him. Philemon, if you say you have sympathy for me, says Paul, show it to Onesimus, by loving him, I will take that as loving me. In verse 11, he argued that this would be beneficial to Philemon. In verse 12, he certainly makes it clear that it's important to him. In verse 13, he even highlights a sacrifice that he's made for him, apparently making Philemon even a little further in his debt to him. In verse 14, he shows that he's being respectful of Philemon's rights. And in verse 15, he's encouraging him to see that this whole situation is really going to turn out for his advantage anyway. In verse 16, he makes the appeal on the basis of Christian affection. In verse 17, again, a kind of obligation. In verse 18, he makes this offer we've looked at to take any debt on himself. And in verse 19, he even takes up the pen himself, which apparently was a difficult thing for him to do. We know that when he did it, the, the, the letters were large obviously showing that this was something that he didn't normally do, underscoring again the importance of this, saying, look, Philemon, this is really important to me. And there in verses 20 and 21, he makes a direct appeal. 21, he gets near to even being what a number of people this week told me when I had them read the letter and ask me questions. They said, well, verse 21 looks pretty close to manipulative. You know, just to downright coercing somebody. Saying that he is confident of his obedience. And you know the tone of uh, of that tone that you adopt with people when you want to gently but very firmly encourage them to do what you're saying. And then to top it all off, there's the verse 22 of I'll be checking up on you. That is 
the length to which Paul has gone to bring about forgiveness and healing in this relationship. But, you know, I don't think in any way Paul is dishonorable in this. Would that you or I expended ourselves in this matter for such an end? Does his going to this length remind you of anyone in particular? Who is the great peacemaker? It's Christ. Paul is just following the example of his master here, who went to lengths far greater than this to make peace. Paul is a picture of someone encouraging, even appealing for forgiveness. Some of you may remember a couple of months ago when we began this series. We began it that first Sunday in July by wondering about credulity and cynicism. Do you remember? Credulity or cynicism, we wondered. Which is worse? On the one hand, we said that cynicism is the tendency to believe nothing. Credulity is the tendency to believe anything at all. And between those two errors, as we've been studying through the book of Colossians for these last couple of months... We've been trying to consider what true Christian faith is. And we've considered many aspects of Christian faith in these studies together. But I'm not sure that anything is nearer the heart of it than this. Not our own righteousness, but the recognition of our own need. Our need to forgive and our own need for forgiveness in Christ. To recognize not our virtue as if it hid our sin, but to realize that our sin indicates what's wrong even with our virtue. And to recognize our need for God's forgiveness in Christ. You see, what we see in this letter is a little miniature picture of the truth that if we would have true Christian faith, we will be peacemakers like Paul was here. What was it Jesus said? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. There is something particularly Christ-like in this, isn't there? I think it's strange to say, but of the few movies that I've seen this summer, at least two, I think, had some presentation of Christian conversion. And it may surprise you when I name them. Uh, The Apostle, with Robert Duvall, And one that I wouldn't probably have gone to see, but I saw on the plane on the way back from the bird's wedding. As good as it gets. I don't know how many of you saw it. The apostle was meant to represent, I guess, in some sense, a Christian conversion. Uh, I think that was the furthest thing from Jack Nicholson's mind, probably, as he played the character in As Good As It Gets. I don't know. But, you know, as I saw those two movies... I think Nicholson's character actually does a better job of portraying at least some of the attributes of what happens in the change of life when someone becomes a Christian. Most of you may not have seen the movie, I realize, so let me just tell you that Nicholson's character is absolutely neurotic at the beginning of the film. He won't step on cracks. He does like this when he's around people. He, He does not want to get involved physically with their germs or emotionally with their lives in any way. And what happens over the course of the movie is he gets deeply involved constructively in the lives of people around them and all their problems and pain. I fear that some of us may have the idea that what it means to be a Christian is to put our hands back like this, be very careful not to be contaminated by each other and each other's problems. And friend, if you think that's what it means to be a Christian, I fear you'll go to hell. Because that is not what it means to be a Christian at all. Have have you found your own soul so pure before God that you're happy to pull your hands back like this As if God could do that with you. And then you just go through life kindly and nicely, not trying to bother anybody, but not bothering yourself for them either. Peacemaking. Going out of the way to try to find those people who are at odds and reconciling them. Smells like Jesus. If we have true Christian faith, that will mark our lives. Furthermore, if we have true Christian faith, we will forgive like Philemon here. 
Forgiveness will typify us in things large and small. And I know it's harder sometimes with the small things. Let me just say that. I think Teddy Roosevelt used to like to tell the story of the Texan who uh, remarked that he might in the end pardon a man who shot him on purpose, but he would surely never do so, forgive one who did so accidentally. He could stand the malicious intent, but he couldn't stand the sheer incompetence of the man who couldn't even aim well. Well, we laugh, but we can be very small people. It is amazing how sometimes we will find it in us to forgive people for huge sins, particularly if they don't affect us. But for those little incompetencies, which act as sand in our finely honed schedule, well, their forgiveness is right out of the question. But friends, does sin bother us less than incompetence? If we are truly converted, can it be? As Christians, we must forgive. Some of you may have read of one public official's remarks just a couple of days ago on Friday during a ceremony marking the 35th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. He said, all of you know I'm having to become quite an expert in this business of asking forgiveness. It gets a little easier the more you do it. And if you have a family, an administration, a congress, and a whole country to ask, you're going to get a lot of practice. But I have to tell you that in these last days, it has come home to me again that in order to get it, you have to be willing to give it. The anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the desire for recrimination against people you believe have wronged you, they harden the heart and deaden the spirit and lead to self-inflicted wounds. And so it is important that we are able to forgive those we believe have wronged us even as we ask for forgiveness from people we have wronged. You know that to remain bitter, whether over actions of ill intent or accidents, whether for sins against us large or small, to remain bitter is a contradiction to the Christian faith that we confess. Do you remember what Jesus taught his disciples to pray? Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh, friend, do you really want to pray that? Think about it carefully before you pray that next time. Do you really want to be forgiven in the same way that you forgive others? And two, if we have Christian faith, we will know our own need to be forgiven. We will know our need to be forgiven by others like Onesimus did here. Have you heard those definitions that the the Christian is someone who is wrong, or rather the non-Christian is someone who is wrong, the Christian is someone who is wrong and won't admit it? Oh, friends, exactly the opposite should be the case. We don't become Christians in order simply to wrap a veil of virtue around our evil hearts and lives, taking on the role, the appearance of the righteous one. On the contrary, we pray God help us strip away the veneer, the pretense of our own righteousness, and rely on Christ's alone. So we can't be all offended or destroyed by the idea that we will sin and that we will even sin against others. If we are to be a Christian like Onesimus was here, that will necessarily entail in our imperfect state acknowledging that we have not been paragons of virtue in every way and seeking the forgiveness of those around us. That's an inevitable part of being a Christian. And how can we get the stuff to be willing and able to do that? By knowing that we need to be forgiven fundamentally by God. When you get what you want in your struggle for wealth and the world makes you king for a day, then go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that guy or gal has to say. For it isn't your father or mother or wife who judgment upon you must pass. The fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the guy staring back from the glass. Do you believe that? I don't. Not for a moment. At the end of the day, that simply won't 
We have too much in us which tells us that our sins, even against others or ourselves, have a reality in them which we can't explain alone and which we can't forgive alone. A few years back, a friend told me of one young woman who came to him in great distress. She was a college student, and she had had an abortion. And in the days after her abortion, she had growing feelings of guilt, eventually to the point that she attempted suicide. Her friends were saying to her, don't be silly. This is just some kind of postnatal depression. Snap out of it. What you've done is nothing to be ashamed of. Her social scientist friends assured her that all of her feelings of guilt were merely socially constructed values. Her psychologist friends analyzed her guilt feelings. But she felt guilty. And none of her rationalizations would take it away. This woman discovered that guilt was not just a neuroses to be erased or to be deprogrammed or reassured through. She wanted to be treated like a responsible human being. She wanted an answer to the guilt which she had incurred and which she had decided was an objective stain on her life and that she was personally accountable for. In a word, she wanted forgiveness. And she had found that the one person you can never forgive is yourself. For that kind of final forgiveness of ourselves, we have to find that one against whom we sin in all sins, even sins against ourselves. And that one is our creator and our judge. So what about moral character and absolutes and right and wrong like we began with? Isn't Christianity primarily about any of those things? No, not primarily. True Christian faith, primarily, first, realizes not that we're right, but that we're wrong. Though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy. We need God's condescending, self-lowering love in our own lives. We need to be forgiven. And we need to forgive if we would have true Christian faith. Let's pray together. Lord, we confess that our hearts are often hard and cold and unyielding. Sometimes in what we perceive to be our own righteousness. Other times in our sin. But Lord, either way, we need the searchlights of your truth. We need the conviction of your spirit to act on our hearts. To teach us the truth about ourselves and about you. Lord, do that, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.